education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand <coughs> with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dr. Judy and I have the pleasure of hosting this morning's um, Health Hour. And today we have an incredible guest speaker, Dr. Aziza, um, who is joining us today and she's going to be talking about all things periods related. And in terms of how lucky we are to have Aziza, I just wanted to tell you a bit about her background. Um, so Dr. Aziza is an NHS GP and a GP educator. She's an honorary senior clinical lecturer, a host, a speaker, a health content creator. She also has a strong passion for health education, awareness, advocacy and empowerment. She channels um, this through her platform, Talks with Dr. Sese, where she um, shares short informative videos, infographics, live discussion and tips on a variety of topics with a particular emphasis on women's and gynecological health, cancer awareness, mental health and health inequality. Um, Dr. Aziza is also the Vice Chair, Trustee and Creative Director of Black Female Doctors UK. She's one of the Board of Directors of Prevention First Initiative. She's Trustee of Sisters Group Charity, Ambassador of the, of, for the Eve Appeal and, women, and Wellbeing of Women Charities. And also she was a, a delegate in this year's um, UN Women UK Conference. Um, she's also been featured on BBC News, the Guardian, Metro News, Stylist Magazine, Women's Health UK, and many more. She has collaborated with and worked with several different organizations, including NHS England, YouTube Health, Copperfill, Joe Cervical Cancer Trust, Black Women's Rising, Pandas Foundation, and many more. And also, in addition to this, she's been involved in and supported several national public health campaigns. So it's such a pleasure to have Dr. Ziza here today. I know she hates personal <laughs> introductions but she does such incredible work so I had to give her all of her flowers today so that's the reason why I, I, had, to, I had to speak on this and in terms of her talk um, obviously she'll go into a bit more but she's going to be giving an overview of periods the menstrual cycle and then also um, discussing some of the common conditions and this is the disparities that black women face as well and today I know we have lots of people joining us from all across the UK. So I want this to be a very interactive se session as well. And I'd really like if everyone could just be typing questions into the um, um, chat box and also just tell us where, you, where you're coming from today, where you're tuning in from today. Just let us know. So it's just nice to know how far this talk is reaching. And in addition to this, I know that this talk has been um, broadcasted at the Khan um, Mum and Children's Christmas Pampering Day, which is a day for mums just to relax, because obviously we do a lot of things as mums and it's just a day for mums to be pampered and also there's some activities for the children. So this also been broadcast there as well. So now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Aziza. <laughs> oh, Julie, Dr. Julie, thank you so much. What an introduction. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm so excited to be here. I'm just going to get my screen up and we'll be good to go. Okay, so let's start. Uh, this. All right. Okay, so 
We're going to be talking all things periods. And I have to say, when Faye, the founder, uh, reached out to me uh, to do a talk, I just thought, you know what, we're going to talk about periods. And the fact that this is the title got me very, very excited. Because as we know, especially within our community, there is a lot of stigma. There are a lot of taboo, shame associated with the word period. Um, and the natural process that more than 51% of the world goes through at some point in their lives, 1.8 billion women women and girls will go through it every single month at the same time. So yes, let us talk about it. Um, I'm Dr. Aziza Sisse, and Julie's already introduced me. I'm always walking around carrying different props um, because I'm very, very passionate about getting the education out there having us all use the correct terminology and also shifting the shame, the taboo, the stigma that's associated because there are too many people who are suffering in silence unnecessarily. All right, so today I'm gonna start off with talking about gynecological anatomy, okay? I'm gonna do an overview of the menstrual cycle and there's a reason behind this, so please bear with me. Um, I'm also going to talk about common conditions and processes that affect the menstrual health and how they impact us as Black women. So common conditions such as fibroids, endometriosis, adenomyosis, PCOS, gynae cancer, perimenopause, and menopause. We're going to go through a lot. So brace yourself um, and get your pens and notepads ready. There's a lot to learn. Um, I want to talk about the disparities that exist in Black women and why they exist, and also what can be done to improve the outcomes. Now, a quick disclaimer, the content discussed today is just for general health awareness and education. So if there's anything that you hear about today that concerns you or makes you think, oh my God, um, I need to get seen or I need some more advice or information about this, and please, please, please do seek help from your doctor. This is not personal medical advice. It's just to raise awareness. All right. I always like to start my sessions with a poll. I know that I'm not with you face to face um, and this is all virtual, but I want this to be engaging. So I want to start off with a poll and I'm asking you the first question is, what is it that you're seeing? The first bit on the screen is, is this a vulva or is it a vagina? If you wouldn't mind just popping on the chat what you think it is, uh, I'd really appreciate it. I'm just gonna have a quick look at the chat. And don't worry if you get it incorrect because it's time for us to learn. This is all about us learning. All right, I got one answer so far. Anyone else? All right, uh-huh, yeah, great, perfect. Keep, keep it coming, keep it coming. Let's make this engaging. Let's see what everyone already knows because by the end of today, everybody will know the correct answer. Yeah. Okay, so I have 50-50 for vagina and vulva. All right. And then the next question is, what is that arrow pointing to? So what is the arrow pointing to? What structure is that? Is it the womb or the uterus? Is it the fallopian tube? Is it the ovary or is it the cervix? What do you guys reckon? Which one? If you could type it in the chat what you think it is. Ovary, ovary. Okay. Is that what you think? Anyone else want to give it a go? Okay, ovary. Perfect. Over here. All right. Everyone, everyone is confident about the second answer. All right. The truth of the matter is this that um, a few of you said is vagina is actually the vulva. So this is the external gynecological anatomy. And it's made up of different parts. So the vulva is made up of this soft bit at the top, the mons pubis, which often has hair. And then on the outer labia, so this is the outer labia, this side. Labia majora is its other name, and it is also quite fleshy. It has hair often. That is the outer labia. Then you have the inner labia, which is the labia minora also. And then you have this little nugget here. It's the clitoris. Now, the part of the clitoris that we see on the outside is only 10% of the whole clitoral complex. The clitoris is actually this big. All right. Mm -hmm. So what usually covers the clitoris is the clitoral hood. And then you have the urethral opening, which is here. That is where the urine comes out. And then you have the vaginal opening here. So this is not the vagina. The vagina is on the inside, okay? Um, and then the perineum just at the bottom. 
So I thought it was important that we know the difference between the two. And this is the internal gynecological anatomy. So everyone was right. These are the ovaries. We have one on either side. The ovaries is where we store all the eggs that we'll ever um, produce. Now, just a fun fact, and I always like to tell this fact because I think it's quite special and it's beautiful. So every single girl is born with all the eggs that she will ever release throughout her life, which means that every single girl was inside of her grandmother because the, her mom was carrying her while she was still inside the womb of the grandmother. So you were inside your grandmother. I just think it's pretty cool. So that is um, the ovaries. It also releases hormones, the sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and the male sex hormone, testosterone. So yes, women also release male sex hormone, testosterone, but in very small quantities. So when the ovaries release the egg, it goes down the fallopian tube. So we have one of each on either side and then into this big structure here called the womb. And then it goes past the womb through the cervix. So that's what we call the gateway of the, to the womb or the neck of the womb and then the vagina. So this inner muscular tube is called the vagina. Vagina has the word in, so it's on the inside, okay? So I spent some time talking about the anatomy because it's so important that we know our anatomy. Knowledge is power. And I'm sure I've said some words that sometimes is, well, not sometimes, it's actually riddled with a lot of stigma and shame. Um, but the words vulva, vagina, clitoris, ovaries, womb, all these words are not bad words. These are just general anatomical words. And you need to know them so that if you go and see your doctor, you'll be able to confidently tell them the areas that is hurting you. So say for instance, you said, oh, my vagina hurts when you meant your vulva, then your vagina is examined, not your vulva, do you know what I mean? So it means that the correct area is checked out. It also means that you're confident and comfortable to go and see your doctor to have these conversations. So often there are many women um, who are struggling and suffering in silence because they're too embarrassed to come forward. So it's to remove the shame, remove the stigma. So again, if we're if we know about these things, we are able to come forward early so that if we do get diagnosed with something sinister, which is rare, at least it's picked up early where the treatment is more likely to be curative and the outcome is more likely to be positive. And I wanted to also talk about knowing your normal. So this is me plugging, and I always talk about this if you follow me on my platform, Talks with Dr. Sissi, I always say it's important that you know your anatomy, know your normal, do your self-checks. I talk about doing your self-checks of your chest, your breast, you know, your skin, your nails, but also please check your vulva at least once a month, familiarize yourself with it. That way you know what normal is. If you notice any new changes, so any redness, any soreness, any new moles, any white patches, anything like that, then you can get to see your doctor as soon as possible so that they can assess it and make a diagnosis. And I'm not saying that it's gonna be something sinister, which is very rarely the case if it is, if you do get that diagnosis. But again, the aim is that it's caught early so the treatment is more likely to be successful. Okay, second pool. Thank you so, so much everyone for answering the first one. So my second question is whether this is true or false. If you could just put in the chat, whether you think is true or false. A menstrual cycle typically lasts between two to seven days. Is that true or false? What do you reckon? True, okay. Anyone else wanna go? Oops, someone's saying false, ooh, okay. All right, uh, anyone else wants to give it a go? Like I said, it doesn't matter if it's wrong because everybody's gonna know the answer today. Perfect, thank you, Hazel, thank you, Sandra, thank you, everyone who's answering. I'm really appreciative, I love this, yes, okay. So majority of people are saying true, um, but we have a couple of people saying false. Let me move this out of the way, perfect. So the correct answer is actually false. And the reason being is everyone confuses menstrual cycle with periods, all right? So the menstrual cycle is a natural monthly process. It happens every single, it is something that happens um, from day one 
to usually day 28. That's a typical length of the menstrual cycle, okay? It involves a series of physiological changes in the body, which is aimed at preparing for potential pregnancy. It typically lasts around 28 days, but that varies from person to person, and it can range from 21 to 35 days or even longer for some people. When we talk about periods, or menstruation, that's another name for it. This happens within the menstrual cycle, it is one short phase of the menstrual cycle. This happens once a month and it's essentially where you're shedding the lining of the womb and it typically lasts between two to seven days. So that was the trick question. But again, this can vary from person to person. Um, I wanna take a little bit of time just emphasizing here that periods are not dirty, okay? It is not your body's way to get rid of toxins. It doesn't mean that the heavier the period, the better it is, because it means you're losing more of the toxins. All that's happening when you're having your period is, so this, this is the womb, as I said earlier, and this is the inner lining of the womb. Every month as part of the menstrual cycle, it um, builds and then it sheds. And this is in response to hormonal changes that happens. That's it. So all period blood is, is the lining of the womb shedding, plus a bit of vaginal and cervical discharge. That is it. Nothing else. It's not impure. It's a natural process. Um, okay, I know this is uh, an image of just a full menstrual cycle. I don't want to get too technical or biological, but I just wanted to spend a little bit of time explaining the menstrual cycle and what exactly happens. So during the cycle, you have multiple hormonal changes that happens and then different parts of the body responds in different ways. So we have what happens in the ovaries and what happens in the womb. So at the very beginning of the menstrual cycle, the sex hormones drop, estrogen and progesterone levels are completely dropped. That's the start of the cycle. Because those um, levels have dropped, the lining of the womb sheds because that would have shed um, in the previous cycle. So, sorry, it would have built up in the previous cycle. So this sheds and that comes out as a period. That's the first part of the menstrual cycle. Whilst that's happening in the ovaries, so there's um, a hormone that's produced by gland in the brain uh, called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. So that gets the ovaries to start stimulating the follicles so that it can become an egg, they mature into an egg. And whilst the follicles are maturing, they're releasing the hormone estrogen and it's that hormone that's causing the womb lining to thicken, okay? And then as the cycle progresses, you have the surge in a hormone called LH, which basically gets the egg to be released. That's what we call ovulation. The egg is released. When that happens, what used to be the egg, uh, what used to carry the egg becomes a structure called the corpus luteum. This is what releases more of the progesterone, more of the estrogen hormone as well. And that just prepares the, the body, prepares the womb for implantation to carry a baby. So as the egg is released, as I say, it comes out into the fallopian tube um, and then it goes to the womb. Now, if it doesn't meet a sperm and no fertilization happens, there's no implantation. So then the corpus luteum, uh, that structure says, oh, okay, there's no pregnancy. I'm gonna stop producing the hormones. And then the levels completely drop. And then you start at the very beginning of the cycle again. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so. How does the menstrual cycle affect energy levels and mood? I want you all to pay attention because this is what is affecting a lot of us women, people who menstruate. Um, everything is influenced by the fluctuations in the hormone levels, particularly estrogen and progesterone. So when we're at the phase where the estrogen levels are high, that helps, that gives us more energy. It makes us feel happier. You know, we're more alert. And also it's just a feel good phase of the cycle. So usually that's more like um, sort of day five of the cycle up until ovulation. The progesterone though, so that's usually raised more after ovulation happens at what we call the luteal phase. That can cause mood altering effects. So some individuals may experience mood swings, irritability, just anger, depression, anxiety, especially during that phase. Now, 
Um, another thing to talk about that can happen and how menstrual cycle affects our mood, when we're having our period or during menstruation itself, that can cause obviously physical discomfort with the cramping and the bloating. It could cause tiredness, we're losing blood. It can cause fatigue, reduced energy levels. And for some individual, it can make them feel tired and irritable. It's important to say that not everyone will go through all of these changes. Some people have their whole cycle and it doesn't really affect them at all. They're not, um, they don't respond to the hormones in that way. But what's important is that you know what's normal for you, what your menstrual cycles are like, what your periods are like. And I would implore partners <laughs> to also familiarize yourself with your wife or your girlfriend's menstrual cycles. Or if you have sisters, understand that, there are certain points which it's not them, it's genuinely the hormones that's making them more irritable and angry. And also it's not you, it's the hormones. So the menstrual cycle can be influenced by multiple factors. So stress, illness, hormonal imbalance, and age. Okay, take a look at this video. I hope that you could hear it. I'm not sure if you could hear um, the video, but basically that was just an illustration of what can happen and why at different points in one month, you know, a, a woman can seem really happy and energetic to feeling really down and irritable. Um, and my husband can attest to me having those multiple personalities. It's not multiple personality, it's hormones. Um, all right, let's talk about menstrual, the menstrual cycle in Black women. Now, often menstruation starts at a younger age. Periods can be heavier, more painful, and irregular in Black women, and we're going to discuss the conditions that cause this. There's also cultural stigma associated with periods. Unfortunately, as we know in our culture, we don't talk about it. It's very hush-hush. It's often seen as impure you know, the, like I said earlier, loads of shame, loads of taboo. We hide our period products. We just don't have these conversations. And there's period poverty as well within our community, unfortunately. The truth is period products are expensive. Accessing these period products can be difficult. And depending on where you are in the world, you know, th these all factor into how menstrual cycles and our periods affect us in our community. And unfortunately, there are specific reproductive challenges that Black women face, which are unique. We're unfortunately twice as likely to suffer with infertility. And you will understand why in a minute, because we'll talk about different conditions. OK, I see more people on. And I have another poll. And I have this question to ask. Please, 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 if you could tell me in the chat what you think the answer to this is. Period pain can be as severe as pain experienced during a heart attack. What do you reckon? Do you think that's true or false? <laughs> so the block capital letter said true. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm getting true so far. What do you guys reckon? Do you think it's true, factually true, that period pain can be uh, as painful as having a heart attack? Okay. All right. So majority of people are saying true so far. And the truth is, it is true, unfortunately. Period pain can be, for some people, as severe as the pain experienced during a heart attack. And the reason I wanted to hammer in this point is because when someone is having a heart attack, in medical school, an acronym that we learn, first of all, is MONA. M standing for morphine, O for oxygen, N for nitrates, A for aspirin. So the first thing that we give someone who we think is having a heart attack is morphine, the strongest painkiller. So someone who's going through period pain that often is thought as, oh, it's just a period, you know, be stronger, stop being weak. They may be experiencing pain as severe as a heart attack, and we give people going through heart attack morphine. So we need to take this seriously. It's not just a period. All right, we're going to talk about these gynecological conditions. Let's go. Okay, so let's talk about fibroids. Now, fibroids are non-cancerous growth um, that happen in and around the womb, usually in the muscular layer. Now, you have different 
um, sizes, different types, and they vary depending on their location. You may have an intramural fibroid, which is inside the muscle layer of the womb. You may have um, a submucosal, which is sort of pushing against the inner layer of the womb. It may be pushing outwards, um, the outer layer of the womb called subserosal. You may have one um, that has a stalk, um, which is pedunculated, so it may come downwards, it may come upwards. Um, so those are the different types of, of fibroids. Now, people with fibroids, 50% won't have any symptoms at all. There are many people who have fibroids who have no idea that they have fibroids. Sometimes it's just picked up through a routine ultrasound scan if they're pregnant um, and so on. But there are 50% who have very severe debilitating symptoms that are associated um, with fibroids, who can have very severe debilitating symptoms associated with fibroids. This is heavy, painful, irregular periods. They may also have frequent urination needing to pass water a lot. And it's because if you look at the anatomy sideways, the bladder is at the front, the bowel is at the bottom. And if there's a fibroid pushing against the bladder, it will affect the, the bladder's capability of filling up and also the bladder's capability of emptying. And that can cause the urinary symptoms experience. You may also have bowel symptoms such as constipation. The same thing, if the fibroid is pushing against the bowel is going to stop the um, bowel from being able to empty. So they may have symptoms of um, constipation. You may have a pelvic pain, pelvic mass, because fibroids can grow really large. Some people have it as big as the size of a watermelon. It can cause painful sex, and it can also affect fertility. And it's because if we think about the fibroid pushing against the um, inner layer of the womb, which is where implantation happens, it then affects implantation from happening. And so it can cause pregnancy complications and the infertility altogether. Now, um, it's quite common. They say about 80% of women will have it. And it's usually diagnosed either through an ultrasound scan, they may do an MRI scan or even a CT scan. Unfortunately, there is no current cure for fibroids, okay? Um, but what, what they can do is they may just say, okay, let's just see how the fibroid progresses, right? Depending on the size, depending on the symptoms, depending on the individual. They may also prescribe some pain medications or hormonal medications to help with the symptoms. They may um, offer to put a hormonal coil, which can help with the symptoms, particularly the heavy periods. Um, or they may offer to do a surgery. So myomectomy is where they remove the fibroid itself. Hysterectomy is where they remove the wound. Um, or they may do something called urine eye artery embolization, which is basically blocking the blood vessels or the blood supply to the fibroid, which then causes it to shrink. Now, fibroids in Black women. Unfortunately, and I'm sure most of you who have joined this call probably know someone or is affected by fibroids themselves. I have a fibroid myself. It's more common in Black women, two to three times more common compared to our white counterparts. And by the age of 35, 60% of Black women will have fibroids. They tend to develop at an early age in young women. And again, in our 20s and our 30s compared to other racial backgrounds. And we often have multiple, they're usually large. And unfortunately, our symptoms, of course, are gonna be worse. <laughs> um, and overall, it has much of an impact to us because of the severity of the symptoms that we face. Again, and this is often seen in black women, we often get diagnosed late. And there are multiple reasons for this. One of it is um, a lot of the times fibroids can run in families. And if, for instance, um, the mom had had heavy painful periods and she didn't think that it was abnormal, then, then you know, she'd tell the, the, her daughter, oh yeah, no, this is fine, this is normal, this runs in the family. But actually, no, there's something underlying. This is why it's always worth getting checked out, please. But there's also the fact that, um, uh, again, health literacy, health awareness, and, and when it comes to healthcare professionals, unfortunately, again, we uh, often, Black women are often dismissed and they're misdiagnosed and they're not listened to. So that can play a part as well. Um, we're all also often faced with higher risk of getting fibroids back after we've had treatment for the fibroids. And the complications are much higher, two to three times. And then, as we know, I, I mentioned earlier, it can affect fertility. So if, if fibroids are more common in Black women, then, of course, it's going to affect our fertility more. And we're more likely to have radical surgical interventions, which is really annoying. Um, so there are other treatments for uh, fibroids. So if someone says to you, oh, you have a fibroid, you need to have your womb out as the first thing, go and talk to someone else, because that's not the case. There are other treatment options. All right, let's talk about endometriosis. Endometriosis is basically where you get the tissue that's similar to 
the lining of the wound in the metrium in other areas um, outside of the wound. So you have it either in the ovaries, the fallopian tube, you can have it in the bowel, the bladder, and it could even be as far as the lung. And they act in a similar way of the endometrium in that they respond to the hormones in the same way. So they will thicken and then they will shed. But unlike in the womb where, you know, you can shed it out through the cervix out of the vagina, there's nowhere for it to go. And this leads to um, scar tissue, inflammation, irritation, and that's what causes the severe symptoms that someone in, with endometriosis experiences. Severe painful periods, pelvic pain that's usually worse than a period, so pain um, in the bottom of the tummy, painful sex, pain when urinating and opening the bowels. This is if the um, endometriotic tissue is in the bladder or in um, the bowel. There may be blood in the urine, blood in the stools, and unfortunately it can also affect fertility, and that's because um, if you have endometriotic tissue in the fallopian tube, for example, it will block the egg from ever getting to the womb. So how is it going to meet the sperm? Those sort of things. Now, endometriosis is, mm, they say it affects around 10% of women, people um, with wombs. But the truth of the matter is, unfortunately, it's commonly misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed. I believe that that figure is probably much higher. It takes about eight to 10 years for someone to be diagnosed with endometriosis, which that needs to improve. So the gold standard of um, diagnosing endometriosis is by doing laparoscopy. This is where they do keyhole su surgery to look inside the womb. Um, but they may also do imaging like ultrasound scan, MRI scan to look for endometriotic tissue. And I want to say here that even if they don't find any endometriotic tissue anywhere, but you have the symptoms that suggestive of endometriosis, you could still have endometriosis, okay? Now, you're going to notice a pattern. There is no cure for endometriosis, okay? What we do is we manage the symptoms. We may give pain medication, hormonal remedies, such as tablets or the coil. They may do a surgery to remove the cyst itself, or they may um, burn the cyst as well, or they may do much more extensive surgery. So if it's in the bowel, they may do like a bowel, remove part of the bowel that has it. You know, if it's in the ureter, so what, where it connects the, the blood, sorry, the kidneys to the, bladder the tube that connects that them then they may do surgery there as well so it's it this is, can be a very debilitating condition and it, again they may offer fertility treatment such as IVF for individuals with endometriosis as it affects their fertility now it's thought that endometriosis is less common in black women however there's that misconception that it's uncommon um Black women are 50% less likely to be diagnosed with endometriosis, and this is multifactorial. Now, some of the symptoms you may have noticed that happen in endometriosis can happen in fibroids. So someone with fibroids may also have endometriosis, but then put down the symptoms to the fibroids. Do you understand? So unfortunately, there are delays in diagnosis. There are often limited treatment and... This is the case for a lot of conditions in general in Black women. There's not enough research. Also, Black women are diagnosed with endometriosis later. So I told you it takes eight to 10 years. In Black women, it can take 10.5, 10, uh, sorry, two and a half years longer than white women. So add on two and a half years to that eight to 10 years. Additionally, Black women are less likely to undergo endometriosis surgery. And if we do have it, the risk that's experienced post-surgically or post having the operation is much higher. <clears throat> okay, no, sorry. Let's talk about adenomyosis. So first of all, adenomyosis is not endometriosis. It sounds similar, people think it's the same thing, it is not. It's basically what happens is you get the lining of the womb growing into the muscle layer of the womb, okay? So it's still within the womb, it's in the wall, the muscle, um, layer of the womb. Now, it can cause similar symptoms to endometriosis and fibroids that we talk about. It can cause painful, um, very heavy painful periods, pel pelvic pain, painful sex. It can cause bloating and fullness of the abdomen. It, it can make the area of the tummy feel spongy, um, and it can also cause fertility problems. Now, Depending on which source you look at, um, they say that it affects 10 to 35% of individuals. But again, I think it's probably higher because there's so many people who just continue to endure severe painful periods when actually there's something underlying that's causing it and they don't get checked out. Treatment includes 
having pain medications, having hormonal treatments such as tablo uh, sorry, tablets or coil, um, or they may do a surgery to burn the endometrial layer of the womb so that it doesn't grow into the, um, the muscle layer. Now, this is the only condition so far that we've spoken about where there is a cure. And the cure for this is where they take out the womb completely and that cures um, the person of the symptoms. However, the cause of adenomyosis is unclear. The cause of fibroids is unclear. The cause of endometriosis is unclear. There's a reason behind that. We'll have a chat in a second. Now, adenomyosis in Black women, unfortunately, Black women are twice as likely to develop adenomyosis. We don't know why. And because the only cure is hysterectomy, this again increases the reasons why more and more Black women have their womb out, right? Um, unfortunately, there are delays in diagnosis. We've kind of spoken about the multifactorial elements, um, as well as being dismissed and not listened to, but also because... There, there are individuals who have fibroids, adenomyosis, and endometriosis, and they may put it down to the endometriosis, or they may put it down to the fibroids and not know that they also have adenomyosis. Now, let's talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome. So poly meaning many, cystic meaning cysts, and then ovary syndrome. Now, the name is a bit of a misnomer because you don't have to have many cysts in your ovaries to be diagnosed with um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Actually, you only need to have three, sorry, two out of the three um, features. So you need to have irregular periods, or have acne or excess hair. And that usually happens more because in this condition, there is a higher level of the male sex hormone floating around um, and uh, or polycystic ovarian syndrome. So if you have two out of three of those, you are diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And this is because of a hormonal imbalance that causes multitude of symptoms, including irregular periods. Um, it can cause fertility pro problems. It can cause weight gain. And then like I say, acne, um, excess hair, male pattern baldness, and it can also cause heavy periods. We don't quite understand why this happens, but one of the hormonal changes that happens is, um, is resistance to a hormone called insulin. Insulin helps to process sugar. Now, if we're resistant to it, this then has a multitude of factors, uh, complications that it can cause, including diabetes. It can affect, um, uh, increase our risk of getting heart attacks, strokes, that kind of thing. It can affect us, making us more prone to gaining weight. It can make it difficult to lose weight. These are all associated with this condition. Now, um, it's said to be affect between five to 20% of people. Again, it could be more because there's so many people who may have these symptoms that don't come forward. Um, often diagnosed by looking at the different hormones, doing the ultrasound scan, and then the rudder down criteria is what I told you, um, the three features, you only need to get two of the three. Unfortunately, another condition where there's no cure, but there are things that one can do, uh, like improving our lifestyle, eating healthily, exercising, um, also taking hormonal medications may help. It can help to regulate periods because someone who has polycystic ovarian syndrome, the period, they often have irregular periods or they may miss multiple periods or like it could be several months before they have a period. So the hormonal medication can just make it more regular if they're taking the combined pill. Um, again, I mentioned about insulin resistance, medications that help to make the body more sensitive to insulin can help. And then they may also have fertility treatment. The reason that uh, fertility treatment is often needed is because like I say, you're not all ovulating every single month. So that affects the chances of getting pregnant if an egg is not released. As I say, the cause is unclear. Um, is unclear. So PCOS in black women. Now PCOS impacts black women more severely than white women. Our symptoms are more intense. Um, we have worse insulin resistance, which means that we're more likely to be obese and also have higher cardiovascular risk. So th those are things like having a higher risk of having strokes, heart attacks, high blood pressure, and so on. Um, the symptoms being worse can affect someone's self-esteem, right? So the excessive acne, having hair in places that you wouldn't expect, that will have an effect on the self-esteem and also the, the mental health of the individual struggling with it. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of gaslighting that comes with this condition um, and often a lot of dismissal because, you know, there's the, the reality that, oh, well, you know, if you just lost some weight, your symptoms would improve. But it's sort of a vicious cir circle or it's a catch 22. It's difficult to lose the weight because um, of the condition itself that causes weight gain. Um, 
And so it's not as easy as just lose the weight. You know what I mean? There needs to be more compassion. Um, so there, yes, there's a lot of delayed diagnosis. There's inadequate and unfortunately suboptimal treatment. All right, let's quickly cover perimenopause and menopause because we can't talk about periods without talking about what happens when period is about to end. So peri meaning around the menopause. So this is um, a period of time before menopause happens, okay? So this can last several years, between four to eight years, even longer for some individuals. Now, um, perimenopause, the individual can have similar symptoms to menopause. So when we say menopause, this is when periods have completely ceased. Oh, there's a pull up. Okay, this is when periods have completely ceased um, and ovarian function has ended. So for 12 consecutive months, no periods, then you've gone through menopause. The average age is 51, but it can happen younger than that. It can happen later than that. There's so many symptoms that happens with menopause. And um, to be honest, th there are physical symptoms, psychological symptoms, and also gynecological symptoms. I've listed them there, but it's not just hot flushes is the main point I wanted to say. You can get muscle aches and pains. You can get skin and hair changes, weight gain, sleep disturbance. It can affect the mental health. It can cause mood changes, irritability, anxiety. It can cause brain fog. There are individuals who feel like they're losing their mind or they may be going through early dementia because of um, the symptoms associated with menopause. It's so important to, to be aware of this. And then there's vaginal dryness that can happen. It can affect um, someone's libido, so their sexual desire. Um, it can cause urinary problems. All of these things need to be spoken about and it shouldn't be taboo. Because like I say, there are so many people who are suffering in silence because we don't talk about this, but actually they're common, okay? Um, now, the prevalence, every woman is going to go through perimenopause and menopause. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to go through these symptoms. There's some people who go through who go through it and they're absolutely fine. They, they, don't know, they don't notice any symptoms at all. And then you have the ones that find the symptoms extremely debilitating, okay? Um, now, they usually we diagnose it based on the symptoms majority of the time. But if someone is having it um, younger than we would expect, so younger the age of 45 or, or 40, then we do a blood test and, um, and just go through their symptoms as well. So treatment, I put lifestyle improvement first because for anything, I always talk about lifestyle. Make sure that you're eating healthily. Make sure that you're getting your exercises in. Make sure that you're maintaining in a healthy way. All of these things can help to impact and improve um, menopause and perimenopausal symptoms. Then there's a the treatment with hormone replacement therapy. Now, when you go through menopause, what happens is the, the ovaries are no longer producing the hormones anymore, and that's what's causing the symptoms. So we're replacing um, the hormone that you've lost um, through menopause with HRT. Now, if you can't take HRT or you choose not to take HRT for whatever reason, um, there are alternatives to HRT, which includes antidepressants, black cohosh, and then some people also have uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as well, which helps. Menopause in black women. Unfortunately, there are, um, it usually happens at a younger age. Um, we often get it eight months to two years younger. And if you, depending on the literature you read, some even say 10 years younger. Um, our symptoms are usually worse and they last longer and they worsen with age when actually with other cult, um, other ethnicities, it often gets better as you get older. Black women are three times more likely to have premature menopause. So when we say premature menopause, this is earlier than we would expect. So younger than the age of 40, I believe. Um, and there are some studies that say that black women don't really take HRT compared to white women. And I know there are a multitude of factors for that, but that implement that then affects how, um, how severe our symptoms are. Also, African um, American women experience menopause resulting from hysterectomy. Um, they they usually have more severe hot flushes. I already mentioned that unfortunately, black women are more likely to have hysterectomies, have their womb taken out. So unfortunately, we're more likely to have worsening symptoms or affect our symptoms um, affect us even more. So black women enter men a midlife with more adverse cardiometabolic profile, which basically means that we're more likely to have heart attacks, to have strokes, to have eye diseases, kidney diseases, and we have more physical limitation. And there are a multitude of factors that um, play a part in this, but um, part of it is also because we, we started early. 
Okay, I want to touch on gynecological cancer because I think it's really important. I know that often in our community, when we talk about cancer, it's met with um, discomfort and um, and fear, but not talking about it doesn't make it go away. Gynecological cancer happens. It affects 22,000 um, women in the UK every year that 22,000 um, women are diagnosed with gynecological cancer. That's 60 a day. And 21 of these people die every single day, okay? So we need to talk about this. There are five main gynecological cancers, ovarian, womb, vulval, cervical, and vaginal. And I put the symptoms on the screen. I got this from the Eva Peel, a charity um, that I'm an ambassador for. I think they're really great. So they put the symptoms outlined there. And I want you to know that just because it says that's a symptom of gynecological cancer doesn't mean that if you have that symptom, you have gynecological cancer. It just means you need to get checked out so we can rule it out. So symptoms include abnormal bleeding. When we say that, we mean bleeding um, in between your periods, bleeding during or after intercourse, or bleeding after menopause. So if you've gone through menopause after 12 consecutive months, you haven't had a bleed and you start bleeding, you need to get that checked out. Also, if you notice that your periods have become heavier or they've become longer or they've changed, they've become more painful, just get it checked out just in case. If you've noticed persisting bloating, so this is bloating of the tummy that doesn't go, come and go. It's just constantly there for three weeks or more, get that checked out. If you notice any change in your bowel habits, they become much looser or become more constipated, get it checked out. Any changes in vaginal discharge, so if it's become more foul smell, if it's become pinkish or brown or dark, you know, not to what is normal for you, get that checked out. And if you notice a persistent vulval or vaginal itch or it's changes to the way that it looks or feels, remember you need to do your vulval checks at least once a month, please get those checked out because those can be symptoms associated with um, gynecological cancer. Now, to treat gynecological cancer really depends on which cancer it is, the stage of the cancer, and the individual, okay? So um, it may be that they'll do surgery and or chemotherapy or radiotherapy and immunotherapy. Um, it all depends on the individual. Now, gynecological cancer in Black women, why I really wanted to discuss this. Unfortunately, we have higher prevalence of cervical cancer and we have higher death rates. So I'm going to spend a, a couple of minutes talking about the importance of please attending your cervical screening appointment. If you get an appointment in the post and they tell you to go and to get your cervical screening, please, I beg you, go and get it done. This is a way that we can prevent cervical cancer for, from occurring. It's not a test for cancer, it's a test to prevent cervical cancer. So we try and catch it before it happens, right? Um, so please attend your cervical screening. Uh, in the in England, you get invited every five years now. So please get, get that checked out, okay? Because we can prevent um, cervical cancer from developing and we can improve our rates. Also, um, unfortunately, we're more likely to be diagnosed with womb and ovarian cancer at a later stage. In fact, we're more likely to be diagnosed um, at a late stage with breast womb, ovarian, non-small cell lung, lung cancer, and colon cancer. So we need to, to really look into this and be aware of the symptoms to look out for, educate ourselves, and please see your doctor as soon as there's anything that you're concerned about. Because like I say, the earlier you're diagnosed, the more likely that it will be curative and more likely for the treatment to be successful. Later stages, outcomes worse. We have poor survival rates. And um, there was a recent study done by the NHS England and uh, yeah, at Cancer Research UK, NHS England and Cancer Research UK to say that ethnicity is a significant factor in late diagnosis for women with breast, ovarian, uterine, non-small cell cancer, colon cancer, and for men, prostate cancer. Ethnicity, just because you're Black or a minority ethnic group, actually it's not ethnic minority anymore, it's ethnic minority, basically if you're of, the, of a different ethnicity, that in itself can um, increase your risk of developing cancer or getting diagnosed with cancer at a late stage. Hmm, I'm just um, conscious of the time. Um, Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is another condition that happens. Um, basically, it's a severe form of PMS, premenstrual syndrome, where you get significant emotional and physical symptoms in the luteal phase. So that's the second half of the cycle. 
Um, there's no cure. I'll go into more depth if we have more time later. But in Black women, it's often said to be less common. However, I think because of the cultural stigma when it comes to anything mental health, which a lot of the symptoms associated with PMDD is, um, I think that's why we probably see it as less when perhaps there are more people who are associated with it. And we know that the stressors that we get and the mental load of constant racism, microaggression, those can aggravate symptoms. And we often get diagnosed late again, unfortunately, so the treatment is also late. We've touched on this already. Unfortunately, infertility in Black women, we're more likely to have um, fertility problems, two times more likely. And the factors associated with this include cultural stigma and taboo. There is still a lot of misunderstanding about fertility um, within our community. And just important to say that when there are fertility struggles, it's 50-50. It's not, and it should not be blamed on anyone, period. But it shouldn't be blamed just on the woman because it's not just to do with the woman, okay? Um, there are lim limited resources and limited access, limited donor options. Um, we don't donate eggs. We don't donate um, sperm, really. And there's a lot of healthcare bias when it comes to fertility treatment. A black women, we don't often seek or receive fertility treatment early enough. We're always delayed in either coming forward or at least being taken seriously to be seen so that we get the treatment earlier. And there's a lot of isolation because when we talk about fertility treatment, it's predominantly in a white medical setting. So that makes things a bit uncomfortable. And again, it makes it difficult for people to come forward. So why do you think with every single condition that I've just explained, there are disparities. Why is it that Black women face the worst outcomes with these conditions? What do you think? Oh, someone actually asked, why are the symptoms and outcome worse than Black women? Well, what do you think? <laughs> Tell us the age. Okay, cervical screening um, in the UK, you get that invited between the ages of 25 to 65 okay so with regards to this uh question someone is saying it could be the food that we eat yeah i guess that could play a part yeah that's a good one um although technically some of what we eat is actually um, it's not too bad it's just the additional <laughs> some of the additional things that we add on to it it could be the chemicals and hair products that is very true yeah we do know that for sure when it comes to um breast cancer i think and also fibroids they've said that relaxers uh can increase the risk of developing those and then someone said we don't get screened that's so true we don't get screened so we get diagnosed late we're not involved in research enough yes i completely agree with that so um the disparities i mean there's so many reasons i've literally just listed a, a few this is by no means exhaustive but the truth is black women we are often unseen we're unheard we're misunderstood there's conscious and unconscious bias in the system there's institutional and systemic racism this is a fact there are genetic factors that come to play there are also socioeconomic and lifestyle factors as someone said the food we eat um weight those sort of things. Lack of representation in healthcare leadership roles, and we know this for a fact, there are not many of us at the top. Um, we're not involved in clinical trials. We're not involved in medical research. There is a reason for this because there's a lot of distrust when it comes to what's um, happened in the past and how we were used and abused, unfortunately. But we need to start coming forward now because we need to find out why this is happening to us. There's so many of us who are suffering and so many of us who are dying. Also, media campaigns doesn't have enough representation of Black women. There's so many people who think, well, breast cancer doesn't happen to Black women because they don't see it, you know, but it is the case. You know, poor access to care. There's also the cultural incompetence, and that's both ways with regards to how, when we started this call, a lot of us could understand certain nuances, and you only understand it if you're within it. So there's there's not enough of that cultural nuance in um, healthcare. There's lack of or minimal health awareness within our community. And this is why I really applaud organizations like Khan having these um, meetings every single week, giving our community the knowledge to empower themselves to come forward when they have symptoms, to be able to advocate for yourselves when you're seeing the doctor so you don't get dismissed. I love it. Also, there's poor attendance to screening, as we mentioned. So someone said it. And then there's embarrassment. There's embarrassment talking about 
anything gynecological, anything women's health, there's embarrassment. And often it's hush hush, let's not talk about it. You know, you have people who may be having severe discomfort in their vulval area, but they won't come forward because they're embarrassed because you don't talk about these things. They may be having severe heavy painful period, but they don't come forward because you don't talk about these things. No, we need to talk about these things, okay? We need to change the narrative. We need to be comfortable with these conversations because ultimately, this is people's livelihoods. Um, so what can we do to improve these things? I've just written a couple of things. Education awareness, always my uh, my big go-to. There needs to be more representation in healthcare research and trials. We need to improve the access to care. We need to have more community advocacy groups, more culturally competent healthcare. So more of us at the top to be able to talk about these things and why they're important. Um, better nutrition better physical activity. We need to be doing more exercises. I know it's hard when the weather is the way it usually is, but try and get that in. And also more advocacy and policy changes. Now, the last poll before we end, and I'll answer a few questions before we close as well. If everyone can answer in the chat, how much more research is there on erectile dysfunction compared to PMS? How much more research do you think? Two times more, three times more, four times more, five times more. What do you guys reckon? Someone said three times more. All right, I'll wait for a couple of you, a couple more. Okay, someone said five times more. Someone said five times more. Five, okay, okay. All right, Um. yeah. Unfortunately, there is five times there is five times more research, five times more research in erectile dysfunction compared to PMS. Erectile dysfunction that affects 19% of men compared to PMS that affects 90% of women. There is not enough research done in women's health. In fact, it's about one to two percent overall if we exclude cancer. That's one to two percent for 51 percent of the population it's insanity and this is why every single condition that we've spoken about today why they happen still unclear we don't have enough research we need more research so we need to support and donate towards research in women's and gynecological health organizations like five times more black women rising the eve appeal joe cervical cancer trust well-being of women please let's try and get more money put into the research particularly as well for uh, people within our community so we can change the narrative because it is about time and if you won't do it for me <laughs> do it for the cute little girl in the picture do it for our next generation our daughters you know and the next generation and the generations after that because enough is enough that's it <laughs> thank you so much for listening to me ramble on for that long um i hope that you found that useful and i'm happy to answer a few questions before we close um if you want to contact me i'm on doctors to say 101 at gmail.com or um you can check out my socials and see more of the videos that i showed you at talks with doctors to say and visit my website www.talkswithdoctorssay.com that's it <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Dr. Aziza. I mean, it was so informative. I had my pen out making little notes as well. Um, we had so many questions coming through. We had so many participants who've not just joined, but stayed throughout your talk. So it was so informative and so engaging. And thank you so, so much again for an incredible presentation. Um, so I was trying to keep up with all the questions. So I made a little document with all the questions that were coming through from the socials, coming through on the chats as well. Um, so one of the questions that came through was, can we take hormone pills to balance our mood during the cycle? And I think you did have a segment on your chat and your um, discussion that you wanted to mention that. So I'll, I'll let you yeah. just a bit more. Yeah. So, um, yeah, basically what happens is um, when I was talking about PMDD, I didn't really touch on it. I was just conscious about the time. So premenstrual dysphoric disorder, those are individuals who suffer with abnormal reactions to the normal hormonal changes that happens throughout our cycle. Right. Um, because as we, as I showed you before, there's a flood. You know, what? I'm going to keep sharing my screen so I can share the um, images if that's OK. Sure. Um, so yeah, so we have the hormonal fluctuations that happen throughout the cycle. And um, 
what sometimes happens to help manage people who really struggle with the responses to these hormones is we give them um the either the pill or um the combined pill or we even give them just any of the hormonal pill just to keep everything stable instead of do you see these fluctuations are happening on the screen instead of those fluctuations happening you keep things at bay which often can help to you know stabilize things but i also have to say that for some individuals unfortunately they do react to the pill and that can affect their mood in a negative way so it's just finding the right balance and also knowing that if you're tried on one pill it doesn't mean that that's the only option for you there are different options available and they can um, chop and change until we figure out what works for you and ultimately if you feel like something isn't working don't suffer in silence tell your doctor and they can give you um, alternatives Okay, thank you so much for that. And then another question someone asked was, how do we avoid getting fibroids? Oh, question. Do you know what? I can't confidently answer that because unfortunately we still don't know why exactly it happens, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, we know certain things that may aggravate it. Like if you have high estrogen um, rich foods, like I think there's a lot in soy. Um, mm -hmm. Also, we know yeah, that if you have too well. much rich meat, Yep. You know, those sort of things can aggravate it. So if you want to try and avoid those, those may help. Um, we also, yeah, th those are the main things that I would say with regards to fibroids, because we don't know for sure. And until we get more research, um, it, it's it's difficult. But yeah, healthy, to be honest, I'll always say the same thing. We know that having a healthy, balanced diet, having loads of greens and, you know, vegetables and fruits and maintaining healthy weight, exercising, all these things can help. Um, so I would just encourage you to live that that healthy lifestyle and avoid yeah, things that have too much um, estrogen pro products within it. And we know and it's been said that plastic, having loads of Tupperware that has plastic um, when you heat it up in the microwave or if you put hot food on it when it breaks down again it the, the chemicals turn into high estrogen components or something along those lines so they can influence the increased uh, development of fibroids so just be careful with that okay thank you and another question we have is why in black women i think they were just asking that why are all these conditions so prevalent in black women yeah, yeah. I mean, we kind of we kind of discussed yeah. it. We don't know for sure because we need more research. Um, but there are certain elements that make the disparities worse. Um, so, for instance, when we talk about cancer, we talk about not attending screening. Uh, also, just I feel like the health literacy can be, play a big part. You know, not not being familiar with what sort of things can happen um, to us. But yeah, until we find out exactly why, we won't know for sure. Yeah. And then someone asks that if, um, how will they know if they have fibroids if it doesn't hurt? Yeah, so this is the thing. Um, majority of the times people don't have, 50% uh, of people don't have symptoms at all. And like I say, so I got, I found out I had fibroids really, that it was an incidental. I didn't necessarily have um, symptoms either. It was an incidental ultrasound finding. And with a lot of women in their pregnancy scans, because you don't routinely just have a scan for no reason, but in their pregnancy scan, they're like, oh, you have a fibroid. You know what I mean? So um, and, and usually if they're not causing any problems and they're not, you know, causing any issues or you're not having any symptoms, we just leave it alone and we watch and wait just to make sure it doesn't um, get any bigger. But obviously, if you're struggling with your symptoms with the fibroids, know that there are treatment options and please keep pushing uh, to get the treatment if you're struggling. Yes, I think that was part of your talk I particularly enjoyed is the fact that, that you use an actual medical language that doctors or medical professionals are used to. Because I find mm -hmm. that a lot of times when patients do come in, they don't always know how to describe their symptoms. So it's useful to be using the language that we're used to. So saying that oh, I'm worried about fibroids, I have very here. Yes. I want to have a blood test. I want to have the scan because I'm, this is what I'm concerned about. I think that will help you to um, better advocate for yourself and get those investigations that you need in order to get your treatment. So Absolutely. I think I really enjoyed that part of your talk as well. I think um, it's also important to know that you can say these things to your yes, doctor. Exactly. Okay? You can yes. ask questions and it's your right. If your doctor doesn't want to do something, you can ask why. If yes. you want something to get done, you can ask them to do it. If they don't want to do it, you can ask why they don't want to do it. You know what I mean? Um, that is your right as a patient. It doesn't make you difficult. And if you're struggling to get through to one clinician, you don't need to keep pushing that one clinician. You can have a second opinion, have a third, have a fourth. Don't give up, basically, is what I will say. <laughs>
And again, even in terms of the talk about fertility as well, I usually advise a lot of my young patients if they're thinking about fertility, just to come in and ask for those investigations, ask for your hormone levels, ask for a scan just to check if you have fibroids or anything else, adenomyosis, any of these conditions that can be picked up early so you can get the treatment you need. So you don't have to go for all the additional complications. So mm. again, it's just about knowing what you can um, ask for from your GP. Um, so another question that came through was, does taking collagen help with their womb health? Oh, um, mm, I'm not sure about that one. I'll have to get back to you. I do know that um, the collagen levels drop during menopause, and that's because estrogen has something to do with the collagen production, but I'm not sure. I'll have to get back to you. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. And then someone asks, how can I have preventative GP checks for vaginal and womb health, or is there tests we can only get privately? So I think we touched on that. Yeah. Just but yes, there's anything else you wanted to add to that? No, so in the UK, um, you don't necessarily get preventative or, or routine gynecological tests as one as as a thing. You don't get invited for routine assessments. And that's why we say that if you do have symptoms, please come forward. If there's anything that you're concerned about, or if you want to get it done and you yeah. give us a reason why, we can organize it if you know if it makes sense to have, to have it done. Because we also need to be careful that sometimes you over manage someone, you may pick something up that actually doesn't cause any issues. And then now you're stressed out that you have something that actually would have yeah. been absolutely fine, you know, in the long term. Um, but like the routine checkups that we, we often say to have, you know, um, at 25, you get invited in the UK, you get invited for your cervical screening, please attend those. Um, also, when you get to 40, you get um, the 40 year old check, the NHS check where they do everything, you know, they check your blood, they check um, your blood pressure, they'll check your urine, it's a full screen to see whether or not you have any underlying condition. And usually with these screening tests, um, the important thing to, to emphasize is screening is for individuals who don't have symptoms, okay? If you have symptoms, you need to go for a diagnostic test. We need to do tests to, to find out whether or not you have a condition rather than to screen for the condition. So it's important to say that, for instance, if you've had cerv cervical screening, and I have to emphasize here because there's so many um, confusion when it comes to this if you've had cervical screening it doesn't mean that they tested um for you for whether or not you had um cervical cancer because it's a test to prevent cervical cancer and it doesn't mean it's tested for wound ovarian vulval or vaginal cancer okay if you had a negative screening test and you're having symptoms and you're like oh well it was negative please go and get checked out regardless of whether it was negative yesterday a month ago you know to a year ago please go and get your symptoms checked out because we need to make sure that we know what's happening here and now and also like i said cervical screening is a screening test not a diagnostic test they'll refer you to get diagnostic tests done brilliant thank you so much and then sorry loads and loads of questions so i'll try and go through them quickly so what are the right options of menopause treatments for black women um, so I would say the right option is the right option for you. Okay. I always say that everything is individually based. You know, I know that, um, there's a lot of people who are concerned about the use of HRT, but according to NICE guidelines now, NICE is the National Institute of Clinical Ex Excellence. The first thing that we offer is HRT. And if you're worried about HRT, please go and see your doctor, have a chat about it. In fact, there's a lot of information online. If you go onto nhs.uk, if you go onto patient.co.uk, the British Menopause Society also has some information. They have some inf um, leaflets for patients that you can read about to go through, to have an informed decision, okay? To make an informed decision. So I wouldn't say that there's a specific one for Black women, but I would emphasize that you familiarize yourself with the options and don't be forced to take one thing over something else without knowing exactly why that's the case. Because for majority of people, HRT suits them and they're fine. Um, but for some people, they may prefer not to take it or actually it doesn't suit them very well. You can do the alternatives to HRT. What I will always emphasize is that you lead that healthy, healthy life, lifestyle. Eat healthily, okay? Eat your fruits and vegetables, exercise, you know, minimize alcohol if you drink or don't drink at all. Do not smoke. Please don't smoke and maintain your healthy weight. Those are things that I would say anybody needs to do if they want to you know, live a healthy, longer, hopefully, life, <laughs> by God's grace. <laughs> people are not aware that it's different forms. So there's the mm. patch where 
they're less likely to have side effects because less amount of the hormones is absorbed systemically into your bloodstream. So you can have the pills, you can have patches, you can have gels. There's different forms. So just speak to your GP about the different options and see what's best for you. And then someone asks about whether or not there's differences between people from African and Caribbean backgrounds in terms of all these statistics that we're given. Um, from, I mean, I think I, I spoke about majority of them. Um, do you mean the difference between being African versus yeah. Caribbean? Yes. Ah, I mean, okay. Together. And it's, I mean, we people love them together. Yeah. It's true. So I don't know if there's much statistics for just, yeah. African, just um, Caribbean women. Maybe yeah. I'll give that to you. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm probably going to have to get back to you because the reality yeah. is we have limited research, period, <laughs> when it comes to Black women. Um, yeah. So you're right. I did lump a lot of them uh, together. Uh, yeah. But I'm going off of yeah, I don't what think I, it's lumped together, but I, I think it's just lumped together in general. So I don't think it's just no, I don't yeah. think I've seen separate um yeah. statistics for African and Caribbean women. And then um okay, again, I think this was related to HRT in black women. So taking taking out HRT is still a hard decision to make in black mm-hmm. women. Would you advise us on the positive outcomes of being on this menopause treatment? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, really, it's I have personal patients. I have patients. I have had black patients who've come to me, who've talked to me about their symptoms. We've done all the investigations, oh, sorry, all the investigations under the sun and it's menopause. And it's like, but how can it be menopause causing me these symptoms? Yes, it can cause those symptoms, unfortunately. And I think because the generation before, um, they didn't talk about it. So they kind of just um, got on with it. And it was kind of a thing of, well, if she if my mom went on got on with it then I should be able to to know everyone is different um but I've had positive experiences so I've had patients who have started on HRT and they came back you know like three months or so later and like oh my god I finally have my life back I have my memory back my hot flushes have improved I have energy my mood is better so it what I guess is important to know is, um, first of all, loads of people always talk about the negatives, and that's a fact. Most people will shout and scream about their negative experiences, but not that many people talk about the positive experiences. So it's always important that you be wary about that. Be wary about where you get your health information from and who the source is. Make sure that it's a reputable evidence-based source. Um, and also just, yeah, just know that everything is individually based. Okay. So just because, you know, maybe Dr. Julie didn't have that much of a pleasant experience with one um, HRT doesn't mean that I will also have the exact same experience. And just like um, Dr. Julie mentioned, there are different ways in which you can administer it. Okay. It doesn't have to be that you take it orally or you have to. And also if you've tried one and that didn't work well for you, you can try the other options until you figure out what works best for you as an individual. Like if anything, please remember, this is about you as an individual, okay? Okay, so I think that's come, I'll come to an end of all of my questions. I don't know if there's any last minute questions that people wanna quickly enter before I let Dr. Ziza go. She's given us her time this morning. For, again, it was always such a pleasure to listen to you talk. You're just oh, so okay. engaging, so much information, so knowledgeable. So thank you again for doing this um, with us. Um, I don't think any other questions are coming through at the moment. So I just wanna thank you for your talk today. Thank you so <laughs> thank much you for having me. All the partners and Khan and also I want to give us a special thank you to our partners today um so I want to thank so the health hours brought to us or brought to you um in collaboration with Khan in addition to their long-standing partners which include the Black Health Initiative the Royal Assembly Redeemed Ch- and Christian Church of God in Sheffield the RAFFA International Developmental Agency um, and also the Croydon BME and finally the Enfield Caribbean Association so thank you so much for all of our partners for bringing us this amazing talk and for getting Aziza here to um, talk about periods and all things menstrual cycle related